Um, all right, so good afternoon, everyone. So I hope you're all well and safe wherever you may be. Um, so it's half of one here in, in London. It's day eight of our competition. I know everyone is exciting, but a little bit nervous. So I promised you the last few days will be when we will be inspiring you more than anything else. So Johan, no pressure to you. <laughs> um, so we are hopefully going to give you a lot of inspiration, um, a lot of this last minute boost so that you know you are there and you know um, you are in the right place. You, you know you have the ability to change the world and we are here to support you. This is really my mission, this is everyone else's uh, who's on this call and everyone else who came to speak, we all want you to succeed. Even the judges who will be judging your submissions, uh, nobody wants to fail you. This is not cool. If anything, this is an uncool and that is how we brand you. We are what um, represents real life experience, okay? So we're not gonna judge you because the only judge that will ever be is life, okay? So life will be giving you lots of exams, lots of hurdles in life where you will have to overcome them. And the, the hurdles are not there to trip you up, they are there to help you grow. So every time there was a, that hurdle, that, um, you know, something that's preventing you from doing something, it's just an opportunity for you to grow. That's all it is. There is no such thing as failure. Even if you don't get to that top 10, who cares? Honestly, who cares? You have done it. And the next competition, you will do even better. For me, every single one of you is a winner. Um, and I genuinely mean it. Um, even if you don't get through to the top 10, because the judges have got to only select 10, so one out of two teams will get through. It doesn't mean to say that you have failed or whatnot. It just means that, you know, the judges felt that someone else, you know, needs a little bit of more help to get to the next round. And maybe they want to see this happen in life. It's their subjective opinion and it's everyone else's. So it doesn't matter if you don't get there. But what matters is that you're here, you are now, you're doing, you're part of this incredible competition and um, whether you like it or not, you will grow. It's nine days, or maybe for some of you, it's 15 days. Um, you're gonna learn so many incredible skills that you will never learn in a typical school or university environment. It's just not something they would teach you. It's something you learn by doing, okay? It's called project-based learning. It's something I'm passionate about. And I think it's something that should be practiced more often. And I think schools should be like hackathons, but that's maybe just me. But I'm just hoping you all are enjoying this experience. So we have two incredible speakers here with us today. So Johan, uh, good afternoon. So it's only a year, just a year, um, had, um, an hour ahead of us. So it's not, you're not, it's not too late or too early for you. So happy to have you. How are you? Thank you for the opportunity. I'm well. I'm here in, in Johannesburg in South Africa. We are almost into winter, but I can still walk outside with my T-shirt on, which I know was when I lived in the UK, I always hated people telling me that. But, winter um, in South Africa must be super warm, right? It depends on where you are, but it, I think the, the weather here, well, in Johannesburg in particular, other areas like Cape Town and, and Durban uh, for different kinds of weather, but in Johannesburg, it's fairly mild winters and fairly mild summers. So all year round, it's good weather and you can have a barbecue any day of the year, apart from when you are in lockdown, like we are now, very, very stringent lockdown. So no oh, barbecues at the moment. Yes. yes I heard that uh, you had an emergency, sort of uh, an extreme situation um, and the government literally created this very extreme version of a lockdown, more or even extreme than here in the UK. What, is it, was it, what does it feel like? Can you even just go out to the beach? No. <laughs> so you can go to the shops if you need food or medicine. Um, they've just today, in fact, um, they've almost yesterday, they've, they've got these levels. So level five is most severe. Level one is life is normal. So we went from level five to level four, but it's still a curfew in the evenings. There's still armed uh, police and, and army on the streets. Um, I remember in our country, like in, I guess in others, we've got a lot of um, a lot of poor people living in very high density areas. So I think that the fear is really that the virus might be spreading there. So far, luckily, our numbers are extremely low. Um, okay. But they, they, you know, like in a lot of countries, also like in the UK, it does have a massive impact on the economy. Uh, the interesting thing is all companies that have been dragging their feet to digitize 
are now forced to do so. You know, so in that sense, I guess it's a it's a good thing. Just working from home, yeah. Teams and, and Zoom and all that. So, you know, we we forty no sorry sixty seventy what's it eighty years ago maybe when when our parents or grandparents were in the Second World War, they lived in interesting times. And you know, you you hear all these stories of of the old people where they talk about the war and all that. We're going to tell our children about the time. It's not comparable to war, but the point is, and I think that's the message. There are so many opportunities whenever there's a crisis. And I think it's Churchill who said, never let a crisis be wasted. So the point is, even though this is tough and it's unfortunate that so many people are dying, um, when it comes to this kind of technology we're talking about today, we live in even more exciting times than six months ago. You know, So that's me waffling on. So, <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, talking of war, my, my background is in war studies. And it's fascinating how the notion of war has been changing, you know, for centuries. You know, war, as, as you mentioned in the classic um form you know right now wars are different and one could say that we are living in a kind of war except we're fighting a completely different type of entity uh but we're also oh my son decided to walk in that's nice okay maybe maybe just <laughs> meet him. okay this is the time when i have to mute myself and i'm going to ask you to go ahead um and start your okay so this is the creature everyone <laughs> wanted to see with white, with white hair so um you go ahead, Johan, and start uh, sharing your screen. I'm going to mute myself and uh, turn my video off. Um, let's okay. enjoy your talk. Thank you so much, Johan, once again. Thank you. Lena and team, thank you. It's a, a well-organized event. Um, I've uh, listened to some of the sessions over the last few days. I've actually learned a lot. It's interesting because I think, like with many things in life, we all have a different lens on different things. And when it comes to digital technology and artificial intelligence and machine learning, the different people have different views and it's great to hear different views because that's the only way we can learn. It's, it's good to sometimes listen to people that you don't agree with because they might just be right and you wouldn't know unless you are challenged. So this is a wonderful opportunity. I'm speaking about something that I'm very passionate about, two things really. So the one is artificial intelligence and the other one is education. And, and earlier on, Elena, you spoke about people being in school and maybe learning things um, at these events that they might not learn in school. You know, I was a, an, a very average student in school. And one of the reasons was, it's not because I'm not intelligent, I apparently am, or so people tell me on IQ tests and all that, whatever it's worth. I just found school exceptionally boring. It didn't challenge me. So I did just enough to get through. Um, and then after school, I started flying in my career because now suddenly I'm doing things that's interesting. So I think, you know, when it comes to this kind of technology and when it comes to the opportunity to be exposed to it, as a learner in, in high school or university, it's a wonderful opportunity. So what, what I normally do when I speak about this topic is to bring up three pictures and I'm gonna start off with that. Let me just make sure my slides are working. There we go. So I normally ask the audience when I speak at conferences, which one of these three pictures most accurately um, illustrates what artificial intelligence is. And the first picture you can see there is the Terminator monster with the red eyes and smoke coming from the nose in the movie. The second picture is the cute little robot and the third picture is computer code. And when I ask the audience, they normally, most of them will say artificial intelligence is represented by the evil robot. And the reason is most um, likely because of uh, hot
Am I back? Sorry, I think, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Not sure what happened there, but uh, maybe you could start again because for some odd reason it literally froze uh, when you were talking about your two passions, education and AI, okay. and when you showed your first slide. Uh, this is where okay. it somehow froze. Not no. sure what happened. It, Can I ask everyone uh, to switch your, your videos off? Uh, Shuba as well. Um, so that we have no interferences, and I, and that's why I also turned my video off. Um, okay. Yeah, let's try again. Sorry well, about that. We will tell no. you if something else goes wrong. Yeah, look, it, it could. I did earlier today. Um, I had problems with my internet. I don't think there's a problem now, but if I do drop off again, then it is possible on my side. Then it's you can just play the video I sent you, I guess. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we could do that, but let's try. Certainly. So um, really touches on two, um, two of my passions. The one is obviously artificial intelligence. Very excited about it. Speaking about it a lot at conferences all over the world, mingling with a lot of people who are real thought leaders, leaders in the world. So I'm very excited about it. And then the second topic is education. And Elena, you um, spoke earlier about the fact that um, some of the, the audience, some of the learners, what a privilege it is to, to be um, at a meeting like this, because you won't necessarily learn what you learn mingling with the people, the speakers, the, the mentors, and also looking at the content in, in the school that you're at. Um, I was an exceptionally average kid in school. And the reason was not because I'm stupid, I was just not stimulated. I found it exceptionally boring. So it's only after school when I started working in the field of tech and really started getting exciting, excited about it that I thrived and, and started uh, becoming very successful. So what I normally do when I start a talk on artificial intelligence is I show these three pictures to the audience. The one is the, the evil robot or the, the Terminator creature. Um, thank you, Hollywood, for that. <laughs> the second one is the friendly little helping robot. And the third picture is that of computer code. I then ask the audience, which of these three pictures most accurately illustrates what artificial intelligence is? And more often than not, people will say it's the evil robot. And the reason is because of Hollywood, because of the media. People naturally, um, most people associate technology like this with something evil, something that might in the extreme most likely kill us or at least will take away our jobs and um, we, so we need to fear it. Some people see AI as something positive like this little cute little robot. And, um, but the real answer is artificial intelligence is only computer code and it is by its very nature ambivalent. Like all technological revolutions through the ages, it is what we do with it. So AI can be a force for tremendous good or not. Um, I'm definitely an optimist when it comes to this kind of technology, but looking at the history of humanity, there's a good chance we might mess it up. <laughs> That's why we need more and more people to learn about it, to use it for, for good. Why I'm saying this at the beginning of my talk is the way you look at AI will determine, or and I guess this is true for anything in life, it will determine how much you're going to learn. If you fear it, if you um, want to shy away from it, of course, you're not going to learn a lot. But if you have a positive attitude, if you really believe this can help you in your career, um, this can help you learning, it can help you as a, um, as a, uh, a student and as a potentially a teacher one day, then your attitude and how you're going to approach it is going to be a lot different. So remember this, it's not something evil, it's most likely something good, but it's ambivalent in its very nature, and it is ultimately computer code, it's, com it's instructions we are sending. And um, the thing, the difference between AI and previous technology is not, previous technologies would just do what we tell, the, tell it to do. AI can actually now learn and start doing things better itself without our um, intervention, which is scary, but potentially also very good. Now, just the first slide here, the a topic like this, artificial intelligence, used to be the exclusive domain of what I call the technological elite any kind of new technology through the ages. There was this status quo, with a small group of people who would control it. Luckily, which is also a scary thing, this technology is somewhat out of control. And the point that I'm trying to make is every one of us attending this event, everyone listening to me today, you don't have to just 
listen to the Googles of the world, world or some expert somewhere. Yes, we can learn a lot from them and we should, but you can embrace this technology. You can actually learn how to apply it to your own situation, your own career. So it's no longer just in this limited domain somewhere. All so-called knowledge workers. So yeah, we're talking about attorneys and law or lawyers and um, uh, auditors and a whole range of, of knowledge workers. The, what I see when I speak to my clients, who are mostly bankers or, or work in banking, is that this technology is fundamentally changing the way we work and the way we are engaging with our customers. So even though you might not want to become an AI expert or a machine learning or a data scientist, whatever you're going to do as a career will most likely be greatly impacted by this technology. And then I come to what I mentioned there, the business context. And this is a, a conversation I have with a lot of my clients. And please remember this. What is the business problem we are trying to solve? We often have IT telling business what to do. And it really is business, the business decision makers who, who should tell IT what to do to support them. So of all the amazing things you're learning during these last few days, when you think about going into a career one day, or some of you might already be in a career, is how can this technology help you fix business problems and help others? That's the important thing to keep in mind. I'm talking about the workforce of tomorrow, many of you on the call at the moment. The challenge we have is that technology is changing so quickly that we don't really know all the jobs that will exist in the next few years. We've got some indications. There are some interesting studies. You know, my son is six years old. He will most likely do a job one day, depending on, on where his interest lies. And of course, if he wants to become a dancer, which is great, then it's not a, a new kind of job. But if he wants to work as a knowledge worker, and especially in technology, there's a good chance that he will have a job one day that doesn't even exist. And, and this brings us to the challenge with education, is if we don't know, really don't know what kind of a jobs will exist in the next few years, is how do we prepare our curricula our secondary and tertiary curricula to prepare people for the future. That is a great challenge. We don't really know where we should go with young people when we train them and teach them. So how do we train and teach them? Some of the things we can do is skills that you will take throughout your life, no matter how technology is changing, things like critical thinking, things like learning how to learn. In other words, when you are given a task, uh, and in your career, this will happen. You will be faced with something that you've never confronted before. You have to learn how to learn. Where do you find the sources? Whether it's libraries or online sources, etc. So the ability to learn quickly, the ability to know where to find information is one of the key things we need to teach people. The hunger for learning as well. So even though we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future from certain careers point of view, if you're a good learner, if you're not lazy, if you know where to get information, if you also know what stimulates you, what is um, something that you want to do according to your own passion and calling is maybe a word we want to use, and you can apply that knowledge, you will be successful. Then I talk about this educational unknown, which I've kind of alluded to already, is how do we then as teachers or educational institutions take young people or learners into the future? into a future that's unknown. And one of the challenges we have is that teachers themselves are often not ready. And here's the points I wanna bring up. The difference between now potentially and, and the past, and especially when I was in school, it was a bit of a one size fits all approach. So irrespective of your specific strengths and weaknesses, your specific interests, your talents, and all those things, you just got a plate of food, so to speak, whether you liked it or not. And that's why a lot of really smart people do poorly in school because they're not stimulated. It's not something that they, so for instance, somebody might be very artistic. They might be drawn to music and dancing and they might be in this very left brain analytical kind of class. So of course they're going to do poorly. So in, in the past, it was sometimes difficult. Yes, we had certain studies that we can do with students to find out where their um, kind of talents lie. One of the promises of artificial intelligence is that by all the data we can gather from students, we can, and, and this is data uh, from things like the, the online resources they use, the way they, you can even track where people look on the screen um, and many other 
data resources as long as we obviously have permission to do it. We can actually start taking training and customize it with the same um, preferred outcomes to that individual's strengths. And this is something I'm very excited about in the future. And I wish I had this when I was in school because then I would have loved school. I would have done great, but I didn't because it was so boring. The other important thing is teaching the teacher. A lot of teachers are amazing. They're so good at teaching. They know so much about this subject. I remember there was one teacher in high school in particular who was so passionate and so good. And six or seven years after leaving school and even moving to a different city, whenever I had the chance, I would go visit her because she was almost like a mother figure. She was definitely a mentor. The challenge we have with new technology is a lot of teachers, even though they're great teachers, are not skilled in this technology. Artificial intelligence and even things like the cloud uh, and other kind of new technologies is so new, which we have to teach the teachers in order to teach the, the students. And artificial intelligence can help us here. The other important thing before I move on, connecting everyone. When we think of people who can't access the internet, it's easy to think about some village in Africa. But remember, there's, there are areas in all of the most famous cities of the world, London, New York, Paris, like every city, there are poor people. There are people on the margin of society. And if you can't even afford food, if you struggle to survive day by day, the last thing on your mind is updating Facebook or being connected. So we need to get to a point where connectivity is so much cheaper, where the vices are, whether it's free or cheap, there must be some sort of a social element to this so that young people, irrespective of the situation they're in, can access the right kind of information to train themselves and to educate themselves. So obviously this is uh, more than this is a technological conversation. It's also a social and social justice kind of a conversation. And then what I'm gonna do now is I've got a video of about a minute and a half. And I've asked Elena when she loads this uh, video on YouTube. Uh, Elena, I remember I, I sent you a mail with some of the points because you, some of you might scramble to, to write some of these things down. But there are, I think it's about five applications I wanna show you through a video that's doing amazing things for education. And I hope the, the sound of the video goes through, but it's just a bit of music. So if it doesn't go through, it's not that bad. So I'm gonna start the video now and then I'll come back in a minute and a half to just conclude and maybe take some questions. So here we go. Oopsie, I did something wrong there. Johan, there doesn't seem to be any audio, but I think we are understanding nonetheless. There we go. Sorry, Elena, I think you said something at some stage during the video. I didn't get that. Uh, I hope everyone could at least see the slides and maybe even hear the, the music in the background. Uh, did it come through okay, Elena? Um, we, we did. Uh, I mean, I didn't hear the, the music. I saw the slides um, and it okay. seemed to, uh, to be, I mean, they all seem to be very self-explanatory. Okay. So, um, I don't know whether anyone else heard the music. Uh, okay, from leader, it was just music, so it doesn't matter. So yeah, we just missed okay. the music, but it's fine. Honestly, okay. uh, I think we okay. understood what this was meant to be about. 
Okay, super. So it's, but this is five of many kind of platforms that you can get out there. Look at the URLs. Um, this, the, the, some of these companies are doing really exciting things. So we, on the one hand, we might have to create new platforms to, to help us from an educational point of view, utilizing machine learning and AI. But there are some platforms out there already, and maybe we can pick a few of them and string them together to help a particular group of people a particular um, class. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there are so many possibilities already in existence that we can use from uh, using AI in education point of view. And then I think that is it. So that's the conclusion. What is the takeaway? I would like to think, be excited about AI, don't fear it. Um, hopefully our education will change in that the teachers will become more knowledgeable about this uh, technology. There are platforms we can use to help the teachers and the students. And hopefully we can find ways through AI and machine learning to customize training and education to people's specific skills and personalities, which will make learning so much more fun, so much more interesting and beneficial. Elena, and that really is it. I tell you what, I do a lot of three hour or eight hour kind of um, uh, big conference talk and seminars to do to all of this in the 20 minutes is, is very difficult because there's so much to be said but hopefully that was helpful to people and they got some benefit benefit out of it amazing no that was good um no we we know uh, from our experience and i think this is like research that attention span at this age is seven minutes and that is the reason why i ask everyone to please don't speak for uh, more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes max um you know and um and, and that is the reason because i just know that they will fall asleep after that <laughs> okay yeah sorry that sounded offensive to you all but it's just that it's it's one of those facts that we know um and so i ask everyone okay keep it to 10 minutes and uh, and yeah keep it succinct so i think you've done a very very good job that was amazing uh, and i know there are um, a couple of teams uh, here in this zoom call uh, that are looking into education as a challenge so i think uh, this would be really useful for them the links um, that you have shared and i know you've, you've shared them by email as well so i will add them um, in discord so don't worry about it uh, you will get all those links and and i also recommend if you are tackling education I highly recommend you connect with Johan. He's very active on Twitter and he's very active on LinkedIn. So he will be very happy to speak to you, won't you? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I love networking and great platform to network as well. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. All right, thank you so much, Johan. That was amazing. Thank you. Lots thank of so things much. to think about. I'm so happy you mentioned learning to learn. Um, this is something, I mean, uh, I remember we were giving evidence in, in Parliament. I'm part of education task force in all parliamentary group. Um, and this is one thing we keep stressing that um, this is one skill that we want everyone to understand and to learn. It's learning to learn. It's constant, constantly reinventing yourself uh, and really be adaptable. Um, and so whatever life throws at you, whether it's AI or next time it will be, I don't know, quant um, quantum, right? And then there will be the fusion of the two, the fusion of the three, like try and keep up to date and upgrade yourself. So whenever my, my daughter says to me, oh, mom, it's A-levels, exams, like I keep telling her, number one, you really don't know what exams are like because my education, I'm originally from Uzbekistan, Central Asia, so Russian education. I mean, you can't compare it. We've had, I've had 17 exams in my last year, 17 exams, I nearly died. Um, so I, I keep telling my daughter, I said, like, you don't know what exams are. You only have three exams or four exams or whatever. I said, 17, try 17, wow. And so, um, and, and the second thing I keep telling her, and I, I think probably mentioned it as well, um, real school starts when school ends when the classic school ends, you know, secondary school, uh, university, all of that stuff ends, that is when the real school starts. And the name of that real school is life, right? Yeah, would you agree? This is when you really learn everything. This is when you really learn. And sometimes you have to learn so fast. That's when you so realize when you, you don't always know as much as you thought you did. And unless you're humble and willing to learn, life will uh, be tough you know so i think it's a yeah, you come out exactly. of school thinking maybe with a bit of arrogance some people 
and then life just throws you around and you have to embrace it. It's, uh, I love oh, being, nice. I mean, I'm 45 this year. I don't want to be younger. I mean, I've learned so many tough things through the year. I have years and I want to enjoy yeah. what I've learned and continue learning. But um, it's, it's about the humility to know you don't know and to keep on learning. Exactly. Oh, I love that. I love that. No, that, that, that's amazing. And I think if you carry on learning and reinventing and being really resilient is another thing, you know, because life will throw so many things at you. And it's about, can you be resilient? Can you stand up to it? And can you carry on? Because there are, I know so many people who, um, who have very high IQs, you know, 200, blah, 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 but they're really not doing anything with that incredible mind that they have. And then I see some others who, um, you know, life throws so many challenges at them and they just hit back, they carry on. You know, you have to be resilient. You have to not give up and persevere and persist. So happy that you mentioned all my favorite <laughs> things and we've never even discussed <laughs> what it is your talk is going to be about. So I was so looking forward to that. So I'm really grateful. Okay, Thank so you. Yeah, feel free to stay on this call because we have this incredible lady shuba i'm coming to you of course how are you unmute yourself show yourself um how are you doing shuba so we've already heard your husband uh ganesh on day one and i know ganesh has been uh, really active particularly with team two i know he's been mentoring team two because um he knows a lot about supply chains you know at the who level nhs and everything else and i know team two is trying to um, to tackle uh, PPE shortage, not just across the world, but across hospitals. It's a massive task. I have no idea what they're going to do and how they're going to go about it. Um, but he's been so helpful and he's, he's with me on WhatsApp every, every day, every evening. He's asking me, you know, oh, Elena, what else can I do to help? Can you share this link with mental health teams? Can you share this link with this app yeah, this has been an amazing opportunity because for him it's so fulfilling because doing his job is, yeah, it's good. He's re I mean, he was really passionate to get into UN and do make change in the world, but helping people who are going to be the uh, journey of changing the world tomorrow, yeah. I think he's really enjoying that. Yes, now he, it seems like he's really loving it. And yeah. so we are going to have him as advisor. Uh, so Ganesh is incredible. So it's been such a um, you know, door opener to me as well. I think he already has got so many ideas. And Lena, let's do this with ICRC. Let's do this with Action Aid. And I'm like, wow. Um, so it's been amazing. You two have been uh, so incredibly supportive. And I'm so happy to have you because I was looking for a marketeer, like somebody who has background in marketing. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my, my background in marketing has been acquired i just had to learn to turn my 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 skills into into this marketing thing so i know how to market myself and how to sell but i wanted somebody who actually has got expertise and was doing just that for many many years to come in and do something which is inspiring and i know your talk will be because i've already seen what this was going to be about but also maybe towards the end of it give us some tips um, on what would be the best way for them you know, to find that market because they're all, some of them have, are targeting, I find several markets and I always advise them, uh, you know, find that niche that you can at least start with. You could at least test all your incredible ideas. So don't say this app or chatbot is gonna be for everyone because the next question I will ask you will be, is it also for my six-year-old son then, you know, for a three-year-old toddler, you know? These classic questions that sometimes uh, we don't even think about. And I remember myself five years ago when I was starting out and I also wasn't sure what my niche was going to be. To begin with, I wanted it to be, you know, from age five to 18. And then I realized these are two different markets with completely different needs, you know. Yeah. And then I had to niche, okay, maybe it's going to be 12 to 18. And in some projects, it's actually 16 to 18. And in others, it's 14 to 18. And every project I do is a little bit different. And I try to target those specific groups with a specific message. And I had to learn all this by myself. Like nobody taught me. I did not have Shuba to come and um, oh, like yeah. mentor me and say to me, Elena, I have an hour today. I can teach you X, Y, and Z. So 
so you guys are very lucky. You have the most incredible people uh, that are brought um, into this um, environment to teach you, to give you the top tips so that you don't have to struggle and Google maybe too much. I know I ask you Google first and it's always going to be the, that, you know, Google first. But if, I, if somebody else comes and offers you an hour and says, I have this time, I can help, always say yes. And, and it, this help is just going to be invaluable. So Shuba, whenever you're ready, I'm so looking forward to listening to, to hearing your talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Elena. I'm feeling very humbled already. <laughs> um, but like, let me uh, <laughs> let me start, guys, by first thanking Elena for giving me this opportunity. Um, and I'll introduce myself. Uh, you know my name already now. It's Shubha Ganesh. I have 15 years of experience in marketing. Um, I have worked for seven years in digital marketing agencies. Um, and then the la uh, later part of my seven years has been working across um, some of the top brands like ASOS, Rees, Denim, GSK. Um, and around last year, I decided to launch my own business. And uh, I have my consulting company at the moment. Um, can you guys hear me? Uh, Elena, can you hear me? I can. Yes, I absolutely can. Okay, cool. Yeah. Because I just saw a message saying internet uh, was dropping or something. Okay, fine. Cool. Um, so I wanted to... Uh, speak today on the topic around mindset of an entrepreneur. Now, most of you are launching uh, or participating in this event. For me, that itself is a first step towards becoming an entrepreneur. Um, and Elena and I felt it will be a good opportunity for you guys to uh, hear my story and get in, um, motivated and um, empower you with information of how I made the transition from a young girl into an working professional to a business owner. Um, so here I am today uh, with a story of a young seven-year-old girl who dreamed, yeah. I dreamed about becoming a pilot first uh, because I wanted to be so high up. I felt like that's the most, um, you know, empowering experience. Everyone else are down below me um, until and I was nine-year-old when someone said to me, I need to learn physics to become a pilot. Now, that was a t uh, off for me. I was not a physics student at all. So then I decided, I was thinking, what else can make me powerful and you know, fly up in the sky? And also, you know, I didn't want it to work, right? No one wants to become working and get rich. I wanted to make others work and become rich. So then that's when I decided I wanted to be a business owner because that's where others work and you become rich. Um, that got my journey. So I started having my focus, you know, determination as a nine-year-old to start this journey of becoming a business owner. I do know I had to have a plan. I had to study to become there. So I started having a very clear path towards that. So I had my paper. I wrote down what I wanted to do, which was first study MBA, because I know that's what the most important subject for business is, and then start a business and then become rich. At 21, after a long time of having this plan written down, I did finish my MBA. I did it in finance and marketing because I know those are two crucial uh, elements that I'll need in my business. And did I start my business? No, because life happened. As Elena said earlier, my husband, uh, Ganesh, and I met. I have to tell you, he's a very amazing person. So no one actually turns you on a diamond, right? And particularly when it is right in front of you. So yeah, that's what I did. I ended up marrying. Um, did that mean I stopped my dream? Did I mean I paused everything in life? No. I took another paper. I rewrote my ambition and my plan. So I wrote MBA, marriage, business, become rich. So that's what I did. I again had a plan and I was going towards it. But then again, life changed, right? I became pregnant. I had my baby, which was also not in my plan. Did I get disappointed? Did I feel like life didn't give me good opportunity? No. I threw the old plan off and made a new plan. MBA, marriage, kids, business, and then become rich. Did you notice something? I, always, always, always wrote my plan and was ready for the change. 
when I'm saying we're ready for the change, I know a lot of people say like change is constant, et cetera, but it's having that ability of resetting my mind for the new target. So I was not just accepting the change, but I was ready to live through that change that was happening with me. And that got a positive mode when I went through that. And from there, there were constant changes, right? Many decisions, many changes. For example, I had thought marriage and then start a business, but it wasn't so easy. I moved country. I was settling in UK. I had no experience because finished my MBA, immediately got married. So I was finding it very hard to get a job. So forget about starting a business. Getting a job was getting so difficult. And finally, I do get uh, do got a job. Um, after about, I think, 500 applications or so, I got my first interview. But I was very consistent. I was very sure that I wanted to work. I wanted to do this. So I kept on going through that applications and posting them. And then there came a two parts, right? Start a business, take like years to earn the trust, and then um, establish yourself as a business, or just do a job, earn the trust first, and then start a business and you're launching immediately. So I took the latter part. I worked for 14 years, set myself in the market, earned reputation as a subject matter expert, uh, and then launched my business last year when I was 37. So the whole journey of a seven-year-old to get there as a businesswoman, which was there in my plan, was a 30-year-old. But still, I always had that plan. And I always knew I wanted to do that. But you know what is the biggest challenge? It wasn't about starting the business. It wasn't about learning to do that one or having the plan. The biggest challenge was when I launched my business. Because that's when I started realizing the mindset of how much I had to retune myself. I started having to take tough decisions. I had to disagree with my business partner and move off. I had to fire people. I had to fail fast. I had to learn fast. And through all these things that I realized the most important thing to be successful in business and become rich, obviously, the last part was to ensure that I'm always, always giving the most important uh, weightage towards my physical and mental well-being. Now, emotional well-being is very, very important. It, and being a woman, I always found it was very easy for me because I'm emotionally attached to things. And when I was saying things, I oh, I had to fire someone or I had to make a strong decision or when I had to go through the failure of a pitch, I realized that I had this fear of being a failure or doing something wrong that is going to affect not only me, but quite a lot of people who are in the business. And that moments when I could actually take my emotion and re-energize myself and taking those decisions and be, not becoming emotional was the most important thing. Because as a woman, I want to make everyone happy and you always want to have a win-win situation. But in business, that's not the truth. You need to make decisions where you may know that someone is going to lose, but it's for the wider prospect of the other people in the company. So that's when I realized that I had to control my emotions and I had to really get that under control. And I learned to write my own journals. I started spending quite a lot of time with my kids and switch off and go back again. Um, I started going out with my friends quite a lot. So it wasn't like you actually uh, forgot everything else in your life, right? You bring that back onto. So for when I switched off, is when I became more productive. And as a physical mental health stabilized, I could actually focus again. And when I focused again, I was able to get a paper off and write my plan again. And that's what the most important thing is. So just to bring it all together for you guys, always focus, have a plan and write it down because a plan in mind is not as good as plan in paper. So. Uh, a dream is a dream until you write it in a paper when it becomes your vision, right? Never, never ignore your physical and mental health. And I hope you had learned and got inspired from my story. 
I'll conclude my uh, story, I mean, uh, my whole speech with another story, but this time, how I at 37 got inspired by a teenager. So it doesn't have to be like one sided, right? It can be the other way around. So this is about the story of me and my son. So it was in December, he's doing his GCSE now. So we were discussing about what subjects to do for A levels. Um, and me being me, I wanted to have a clear plan of what he's going to do. So we sat down, I asked him like, what, what subjects do you want to do separation? Cause like, I want to do biology, chemistry and Spanish. And I was like, hmm, they need to be in contingency plan. Why don't you also do maths? What if you don't get what you wanted to do? He just turned around to me and looked at my eyes and said one sentence. He said, mom, do you want me to plan my failure? And that's the day I decided that my contingency plan is going to be 20%, but my main plan is going to be 80%. So guys, yes, have a plan, but plan to win, plan to succeed. And spend most of your time in that plan where you're going to take it towards success. And I'm still in the journey. I'm just 37. I've made my business. I can't say I've become rich yet. Maybe that's my next final stage that I'm going through. But if you have any questions or want to go through any of the other journeys, please, I'm here around. That was amazing. Uh, fantastic, Shuba. That was uh, such an inspiring story. Um, so my internet connection is unstable. Can everyone hear us okay? And does anyone have any questions to either Shuba or Johan? They're both still here. If you have any questions whatsoever, um, please post because they're both here and we are here to help. I mean, from me, uh, Shuba, um, I don't know about you, but I think we need to redefine the word becoming rich. Come on, Shuba, <laughs> we can do that. Is it yeah. really, funny, is it really about financial, you know, a prosperity that you're talking about? Um, I mean, as an academic, I like to redefine or define words. So let's think about other definitions of rich. I mean, for me, becoming uh, rich think... uh, means making an impact and changing lives. So I'm much happier when I know I have changed many lives and I'm doing it already all the time. So for me, that is my, my ultimate goal. I've never really dreamed of becoming you know, rich. I think if I'm comfortable, if my kids have food on the table and uh, uh, we have a roof, um, you know, over our heads and we can travel. I mean, I have been dreaming to adopt a nomadic lifestyle and just travel with my kids and do my work remotely like that. So for me, this is a really cool experiment. So I think you're, I, yeah, you know, I think you're very right, Elena, because rich means different things at seven year old to 37. That journey of what yes. rich changes as the days goes but for a seven-year-old having that rich was sitting in a corner office with 10 phones on the table because that's how they showed as most powerful people in those movies in those days right and from there i mean if you ask me i just want one mobile phone today i don't want 10 phones in fact i don't want phone so that's that's change when you see like yeah. going towards that path but you're right having like being rich can be anything from being enriching or powerful or ability to make that change of not only for yourself, but people around you, right? So rich, everyone wants money. And I feel like money indicates kind of in success in some ways. Uh, but that money can be used for other things or, you know, empowering more because you're employing or you're giving employment, you're um, giving empowering other people in the journey of path towards their success. But I think, yeah, I think it, it can go either way, but what it means that for me at 37 might change when I'm 50, who knows? Yeah. But at seven, when I wrote that plan, it was about having the 10 mobiles, or I mean, sorry, 10 phones around my desk, definitely. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and so I know, I know you um, sort of mentioned mental health as well. This is something um, I, I like to discuss at length, particularly with young people these days. You know, mental yeah. um, health is, we've seen some uh, increase in depression, um, you know, self-harm and whatnot with uh, young people in particular. And the other day I was mentoring one team as part of this hackathon. And I told him, I said, you know, if you spread yourself too thinly, 
if you're going to take every single task you know you possibly can and you have five of you in your team but if you speak to your developer if you're project managing if you're doing business dev if you're doing marketing if you're doing this and that you are going to burn out right yeah. um and i think we see this a lot with entrepreneurs i've had a number of friends who who actually have burned out and it doesn't look pretty at all it's very sad and when it happens um um it's um you know it's really not something you you want to experience so yeah. talk to me about um what is the best way to look after yourself when you are on an entrepreneurial journey i mean i try to go to meditation retreats and that has only been like in the last three years that i thought okay i need to meditate so i try to meditate every you know every morning or every evening um and i go to my meditation retreats and i know a lot of entrepreneurs um who are doing the same particularly with the latest you know there has been so much talk about it um and steve jobs um meditated and all of the um incredible entrepreneurs who did get to the top uh, mental health is something they always emphasized Uh, talk yeah. to me about your routine what do you do what can you advise and recommend and Johan as well yeah. maybe afterwards you can also suggest some thoughts yeah there are two two things that uh, definitely comes into play when i start thinking about emotional or of uh, uh, mental health or uh, well-being as an entrepreneur yeah you're right my days are filled with a lot of task uh, what i learned i mean uh, when i started about in last year april i used to take everything on board and i was doing right from admin on to even the marketing and project managing and all those things that you mentioned but what i learned and what i quickly understood was starting to prioritize task and see where the most important impact comes from what my role is supposed to be playing in the company so if i start i started listing out all the tasks that i do and i'll say which one got the money to the business because my role as a ceo is to bring money into the business of a new client so i started figuring out which one actually got me that and i started realizing that i did quite a lot of admin tasks than actually bringing that new client or bringing that new uh, business into the, uh, into my my business and i started then delegating because i know if i'm going to start there i'm never going to reach my goal so that's where i keep saying write down every single thing that you're doing because that's when the clarity comes where you're spending your time so when i started doing that then i know where i need to focus that's definitely one part but even though i do know then there's there's always like those tough decisions and emotionally attachment that you have to go through so for those reasons i still the second part of having that physical exertion so i used to walk quite a lot i don't um run i can walk uh, so i do quite a lot of long walks i used to get down two stops before my house or two two stops before the uh, workplace and i used to walk because that 10 minutes of walk i clear my mind i i remove myself from being a mom or a wife or anything and become into the role of and see and start planning what my day is and in the evening i do the same when i go back home i get down two stops before i walk for 10 minutes where i'm actually clearing off my mind of being an entrepreneur and be- go inside my house as a mother and from there on my time is with my kids and i don't think about my business i was able to segment it because i was fresh by the time i went in and i was segmenting it clearer i think i also love reading books quite a lot so when i'm too stressed out i can i just start my uh, book and i go sit in london bridge is my favorite place i just sit where it is very crowded just lie down there and read the book i feel like the whole world is passing through me but i start getting that very calm mind and then i start uh, suddenly getting new ideas but i always have that paper and pen with me even there <laughs> so when it flows i write it down yeah amazing uh, i mean you seem to have got there to that understanding so much faster than i did uh, i certainly wasn't there yet you know a year after i started my business my goodness i can't even describe the um you know the thinking behind but i'm you know being a single mom with two kids i just never got to that routine of walking before you know for 10 minutes before and after 
it's, it's <laughs> running for me it was running <laughs> it was literally running to collect my son and then bringing him back so everyone has their own challenges but uh, what you're saying makes a lot of sense that, uh, so, that's that's yeah. that's also the part isn't it elena because they, that's also a uh, thing where i actually recognize to delicate because i have a fantastic child minder now being a woman entrepreneur there's an uh, thing that you can become guilty guilty of not spending enough time with your kids because i have to be out i had to network i can't go back home in certain time but i learned that it doesn't matter for my kids that i'm there every day it just matters for them that i'm there when they need me and they always had to when they need me so when there is something in the school i'm always there with them when there is important or i feel they are nervous i'm sitting with them on those days i just don't go to work on that day but it doesn't have to be that every day i need to be there so i have i do lean on quite heavily and that's important thing as well uh, to understand that you can't achieve everything as a single person i lean on in my husband when he's around here i don't know what happens in my house who cooks who does wash it nothing he he is such a great support for me and in this path and i think a lot of my uh, success i'll actually dedicate towards uh, ganesh he's been a amazing person uh, and the other is my child minder i think i can't i can't be successful without my child minder she is definitely in second mom for my daughter who is 5 year old and um, so she, i never feel that uh, i'm actually giving her i mean uh, putting her with a third person they mingle out so much as if she's our grandma so i feel like uh, that synergy of having others and depend on them and agree yeah. that you are going to need those people in your life for you to be successful i think is also important mm. so we have a question here um a question here uh for you do you think management skills can be taught to people and how do you think education can play a role in this definitely i think management things can be taught to people um right attitude is what is the most important thing that you need to develop rest everything else is uh, can be taught so if you have the fire in you to actually achieve as i said like you know having a dream is not a big deal uh, making that dream into vision by writing it down and having that plan is what so uh, those that that energy that i want to learn and do something is something that can't be taught but if you have that everything else can be taught yeah uh, and sebastian there is um there is a management skills course on coursera i'm sure probably not even one like on udemy coursera oh, yeah. and edx uh you can probably take any of those courses and most, and all of them are free as well so yes do ask google uh, consult google and uh, embrace trello yes should be embrace trello yeah. Oh yeah, or yeah. Asana or any one of those project management uh, tools. Johan, yeah. what can you um what can you add to this conversation that we've just had on how to manage yourself, your goals, your, you know, mental health and everything else. It's so tough to be an entrepreneur. Hmm. I've been burning to speak but very humbly listening to everyone. So um I uh I've got a just very briefly a story. My life changed about 6 years ago when I had a mild heart attack while flying back home. from a meeting and i was hospitalized and sick for about um 3 months and it was because of burnout it was because of working 18 hour days um and the the eventual um diagnosis even though for weeks and weeks doctors didn't know what was wrong was what they called um adrenal fatigue so my adrenal glands were run out and then you get sick of almost anything but i remember lying in the hospital one day looking up the the roof and thinking i shouldn't be i mean the hospital is the worst place to try and get better and i discharged mm-hmm. myself and went home and i actually really started studying buddhist principles um and so so philosophy and especially existential philosophy is something i'm most passionate about even more so than artificial intelligence so if you want to get me going <laughs> this is a topic to speak about but just briefly what i want to say for me um i tried to live a life of meditation rather than to meditate at certain times and that could be while um cleaning up the house it it it's about the place from in yourself from out which you live so it's all about intent 
And it's good to have times where you relax or exercise. Those things are important. But life is an integrated whole. So it's if you live from out of a place of uh, being at peace with yourself, knowing that you are imperfect, and um, showing kindness to others. And what is more difficult than that is showing kindness to yourself and being gracious to yourself. For me, and that's my personal thing, because I think we all find our own ways of living. Um, and then I also had to figure out, you know, there's almost these, I see a picture in my mind of the two hills. And on the one hill sits this Buddhist monk or, or any kind of monk meditating the whole day. What a wonderful life. And the other hill is this corporate exec flying in Learjets and stuff. But somewhere in the, somewhere there's a middle ground. You don't have to be one or the other. You can be successful in your career, whatever that means for you. And it could be money or not. But you can also, in the midst of that success and that drive and ambition, live a life of meditation. So, but I can go on for hours about that, but I'm going to stop here uh, yes, now. Okay. Uh, live a life of meditation. This is something, um, I mean, I've only really dived um, into this only like three years ago, maybe four years ago now. I believe it's three years ago. Um, it's been quite a journey, uh, learning to meditate, learning to keep your mind still. It's not really easy. It's not something I'm used to because my mind is frank, frantic all the time. So many ideas and so much going on. But um I had a friend who burnt out, burnt out completely. Um, I really didn't like the look of it at all, uh, the sound of it. And I was so worried. Uh, I felt like, okay, as a single mom with two kids, that's the last thing I want to happen. Because if something like this happens to me, and I saw him in, a, in the state that I never thought I, you know, I never want to see myself in. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do? So I reached out to all my friends and said, I think I need to learn how to meditate. I think I need to learn to, you know, keep myself calm and um, just learn to manage my energies and my mind and everything else and learn how to control my mind. Um, so that's, that was really what triggered because I didn't want to end up where that person ended up. Um, it just terrified the hell out of me. And I was really worried genuinely that if I am, you know, the single mom that I am with two kids, if anything like this happens, what's going to happen to my kids? Because I don't have any family here in this country. My entire family is in uh, Central Asia. Um, and um, yeah, and that's what threw me. But I have been so grateful that I have seen this happen in, with other people. And that really threw me into something I didn't even understand at that time, but I actually understand it a lot more now. So there's more you and I can talk about now, <laughs> not just AI and education. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. All right, so this has been a really fascinating conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed having both of you and I am so grateful. And I really hope every single one of you enjoyed this conversation uh, as much as I have. Um, this is, you know, it's the last two days. Today is it's literally, this is the last conversation of Saturday because I didn't want to keep you, you know, um, online with me for too long because I know you have your own projects and everything uh, to get on with. But tomorrow is going to be the last day. We have a couple of speakers tomorrow joining. Uh, I believe only one, Matt Scott, who I invited to give you that very last boost and Matt and I have worked on a NASA project together. He runs a NASA global hackathon. And he and I are constantly uh, on WhatsApp uh, talking about what, what else can we do to inspire young people or people in general to do creative, amazing things. So he's going to come and speak to you tomorrow. So we're not going to, this is probably one of the last uh, sessions that I'm going to have with you. And, um, and I know on Monday, I'm going to wake up on Monday and I'm going to say, I really miss that. <laughs> And somebody asked me the other day, and then what do you prefer, like face-to-face -face hackathons or virtual? I couldn't even tell you what I prefer because face-to-face -face has got its own benefits. I'm with you there, you know, my, I you know, fill the entire room with my energy and everyone can see me do this. Um, but online, I really enjoyed working with every single one of you. Um, you know, I come in, literally every single team um, is my baby. <laughs> So I feel like, wow, you know, you guys are all amazing. And I'm so going to miss that. I really am going to miss that. I have tears in my eyes now. So this is the time when we have to end the meeting. But I'm really going to miss this time uh, on Monday in particular. And um, so I'm really grateful, uh, Johan and Shuba, you've joined us on this journey. And I'm really grateful to, to all of you, ooh, okay, um, that you have actually uh, stepped in and you've allowed me to, um, to do this project because without all of you the participants here, 
um, and speakers, you know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. So I'm really grateful you have trusted me to do this crazy, crazy project, bringing everyone together. So um, anyway, on this note, I think I'm going to end this meeting and uh, pause the recording now. Um, so I'm going to see you all back in Discord and, um, and let's carry on. We, we don't have much time left. Uh, but I know you're all on track and those of you who have questions, I can see lots of DMs already. Um, I've posted all the information that you need to know, but if you have any more information that you need from me, just DM me because I am in Discord and I'm watching every single one of you grow and, you know, do your amazing stuff. Anyway, thank you to both of you for joining us. Um, I'm going to end here and I'll see you all in Discord. And if you have any more questions, um, Johan is very active on Twitter. Shuba less so, but ask me and I will connect you as well with Shuba. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm going to wave goodbye. Thank you. And I'll Bye. Thank you.